Okay. Well, welcome to our Bible study tonight. I'm glad you are joining us. So we're continuing on uh, in this book. Uh, it's called Just Like Jesus Devotional by Max Lucado. Um, and it's just great that we can be together uh, to discuss the next chapter. Uh, why don't we begin with prayer? Let's pray. Oh God, we have come to treasure these Wednesday nights, the ability to set aside this time to center our hearts on you and you alone. I ask that you would quiet within us any worry or distraction that we may fully just hear the truths that you want to speak to us this night. We give you thanks for all of our church friends and the, the true blessing they are to us. In this time of Bible study, we pray that you would bless us, encourage us, and guide us in our walk with you. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 So let's see, we are on chapter 10, I believe. Nine. Day 10. Oh, you got it. <laughs> Counting has never been his real strong point. <laughs> So day 10, page 46 of the book, if you have the book, um, and he uh, starts out with this passage from Matthew 13, um, says, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Um, of course, the, the context, we're in uh, Matthew 13. This is the uh, parable of the farmer scattering the seed. And we have all the different kinds of soils um, and the ones who hear and the ones who don't hear. So this is kind of the, uh, the parting words uh, that Jesus says, you know, blessed are you who, um, you know, see for some don't see and uh, blessed are you who hear uh, for some do not hear. Um, so the whole point is the, the way that we are able to see and to hear uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and then um, he tells this parable uh, that he wrote. It's this very powerful uh, parable about dancers who are trying to dance but don't have any music. Um, or he goes on to say the, you know, the violin player who has a violin, but there's no strings on this violin. Um, and what an incomplete um, experience uh, that would be. Um, then halfway down the page of 47, he talks about how uh, if this were the case, the dancers would grow weary. Uh, but lo and behold, there's this person who shows up. Um, and he says, he begins to sing a song, soft and sweet, kind and compelling. His song took the chill out of the air and brought a summer sunset glow to the heart. And as he's saying, people stood, you know, a few at first, and then many, they begin to dance. Uh, but some, however, remain seated. They chose not to dance. Um, then on page 48, um, he says, he quotes the scripture. He says that let the one who has ears use them to hear. But the non-dancers refuse to hear, so they refuse to dance. Many still refuse. The musicians come and sing, or the musician comes and sings. Some dance, some don't. Some find music for life. Others live in silence. To those who miss the music, the musician gives the same appeal. Let the one who has ears to hear use them. So, of course, uh, you know, this one who shows up and sings this very compelling song is Jesus himself. Uh, that's the point of the parable. Um, so, um, you know, the first question, it says, what does Jesus' music sound like to you? Um, you know, picture yourself as being one of these dancers, uh, and lo and behold, Jesus shows up. Um, what do you think that kind of music would sound like? Mm. Yes, Jim. Mm. Now, to me, it would be very joyful and uplifting and melodic, uh, and at the same time, kind of hypnotic, maybe, and even uh, compelling to those that can hear it, uh, you know, and just... Uh, it's kind of the music that never dies. Okay, yeah. 
you know, sometimes we have those tunes that just kind of stick in our heads. Uh, we just, you know, they just keep playing and playing. So yes, Laura. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Motivational. I mean, I have so many songs that when I hear them, even though I know my age, I know what I look like, I still get up and I just bounce around and, you know, it makes me want to move. It makes me want to do something. It mm -hmm. makes me motivated. It makes me want to just be energized and fills me up. And yeah, I'm really bad about getting songs in my head all the time. <laughs> and, you know, um, it, but that's to me what it would do. It'd be like Jesus coming and just saying, okay, I'm going to motivate you to do this you know, and putting that spark mm -hmm. in you. Yeah. Like it's the same thing. I think it's inspiring. Yeah. The music is going to be inspiring. Um, that was one of the words. I tried to think of words to describe music and I think it's inspiring, reassuring, you know, um, soothing. I think it's soothing to the soul, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, Wayne. I, you know, think of it as being a beautiful choir singing songs that about his all his glory and find it you know be uplifting then yes okay yes carol well i had two thoughts one i think i was 12 and we were in minneapolis and went to the largest lutheran church downtown and there was this humongous pipe organ and it, it just filled the church with sound and it was just like god was there and then my other thought was whenever I'm sad or happy or whatever, music can, the words always reach out to me. Some song, just kind of like your sermons, you know, it applies to whatever is there and that music is healing then for me too. So it's kind of healing and joyful at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, sometimes, um the the music uh, you know of course music uh, speaks to me deeply and you know i i'm a, a broadway fanatic i've seen lots and lots of broadway shows and sometimes there can be a song within a broadway show that is not religious any way shape or form and yet i hear the voice of god within that song um, and it speaks to me in a way that um, i wasn't expecting it to speak to me so sometimes it's, you know, in unexpected ways and in unexpected lyrics that you literally hear, hear the voice of God, um, you know, unmistakably. It's, a, it's amazing that God can, can do that. So any other thoughts? Yes, Carol. Um, Billy and I both talked about when we finished reading it, a song came to mind for this study. And it's a Wayne Watson song called The Touch of the Master's Hand. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I love that song. It just, it always speaks to me and it's just such a good lesson. Um, so you know it? Yes, yeah. yeah. It's been a long time, but I think the point of it is that it's this old violin uh, that everyone thinks it's junk um, until- it's Yes, yeah. And the bids on it. Yes. So somebody gets up and starts playing it and then the bids just go sky high. Yeah. And it's because of the touch of the master's hand. Yes, yeah. I'll try to post, remember to post the link when you post good, the- Good, the yeah. And the, uh, you know, that the whole point is that uh, when the master touches us, you know, we play beautiful music mm -hmm. too, where some people may think that, you know, what good are we? But uh, when we're um, touched by the master's hand, we can do beautiful things and say beautiful things without even recognizing it, so. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Jim. Yeah, the song that kept coming to mind for me was Lord of the Dance, <laughs> you know, and just, uh, you know, I'll lead you all where wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all if, in the dance, said he. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One, yes, Carol. One other thing I thought about was I thought about deaf people at a dance and going by vibrations or whatever. You can use other senses to enjoy the music, so to speak. And it made me think that I might want to try that with my preschoolers, have them dance with no music and see what happens. I might try that this year. Yeah, neat, neat. Yeah. So his next question is, where do you fit in the story that was told, you know, about the dancers um, who are trying to dance and just can't um, until uh, Jesus comes along and sings that song? So yes, Chet. Well, 
I definitely stand among the deaf. <laughs> and I'm totally unable to dance. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Peg. Do you second that motion? <laughs> yeah. We took dance lessons one time through Arthur Murray or whatever. We had like three classes and the, uh, the teachers were a husband and wife. And they said they were going on vacation and that they'd call us when they got back. And that was about 42 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really long vacation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Chet, I'm, you know, I'm right with you. I, I'm a terrible dancer too, but the fact that uh, Jesus knows that and he still invites us, you know, to the dance, uh, I think that's, that's a grace filled, just as for the communion rail, you know, that God knows that we are not worthy uh, of that gift of forgiveness, and yet the, the invitation stands. Um, I think that's, a, that's an act of grace that even, you know, Jesus knows that we're terrible at dancing yet and still invites us to come into dance. So, um, yes, Marcia. When you speak about that, that makes me think of the Garth Brooks song, The Dance. Yes. And the line that yep. says, yes. Yes. I could have missed yes. the pain, but I would have had to miss the dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So much of life is like that. Yes. Yeah, I wrote down, you know, it says, where do you fit into this story? I wondered where um, in my life that I'm not listening um, you know, I know that Jesus is with me and he's singing this beautiful song to me, this love song, inviting me to dance. And I just wonder when um, those times in my life that I am not listening um, or maybe that I'm hearing what I want to hear rather than what Jesus is truly singing to me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the humanness, um, I always want to um, hear what I want to hear. You know, I, we want to, um, we want to, um, offer our plans to God and say, God, you know, bless me, you know, this is my desire, bless me in this endeavor, rather than asking God, you know, what is your will for my life? And how do I fit into your plan? And how can I go about that? And how will you equip me to do that? Um, it's a it's a different, it's a different kind of question. Um, the same thing happens when uh, people come to me and say, you know, where in the Bible does it say this? Um, I get very leery of that question, because they have an agenda um, that they want to um, back up by scripture, and they want me to tell them exactly where it says that in the Bible. Um, the, the better question for me is always, you know, what does the Bible say about, you know, whatever the, the topic is, rather than trying to proof texting and say, mm -hmm. you know, where in the Bible does it say this? I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to prove to my daughter or to my sister, you know, this is what the Bible says, but I can't quite remember where it says that. Well, sometimes it doesn't say that. Um, so we have to back up and say, you know, what does the Bible actually say about this? And we can try to fit our whole understanding um, into that, that equation. So any other thoughts about where you fit into this story? Or how about, you know, the third question, how have you most often responded to Jesus' invitation to dance? Yes, Carol. Well, I remember getting an email a couple of years ago saying we're going to do a um, Lenten services where people are going to do their own thoughts and I don't dance. And really, <laughs> I get dizzy just turning around in a circle. And um, I wanted to say no but Jesus made me dance that year. And, you know, it's just different things like that, that you just feel like you can't say no, right. even though you're not good at it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And ultimately people were blessed by, you know, the message that you gave. So, well, I don't know about that, but the journey for me was, you know, it was a journey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Carol. <laughs> Go ahead, laugh on you. Susan, did I'm I hear that? I'm not laughing at you. I'm not. Did I, I think I heard Susan saying she's willing to go next. I think that's what yeah, I heard Susan next. Saying. She's going to do the interpretive dance Sunday. I'll dance for you. <laughs> speaking, you know, speaking of that, um, I always thought it was kind of weird when people danced in church until Pentecost, I don't know how many years ago, that Sarah danced and that was the most beautiful oh yeah i've ever mm -hmm. seen i've never forgotten it 
Yes. And that was out of my comfort zone to begin with, but it turned out to be a real blessing. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yes. Um, in fact, um, uh, Sally Weber Hawthorne, in the midst of her uh, Parish Lay Ministry Academy, she is planning a uh, service that's uh, celebrating the Holy Spirit in August, and uh, Sarah will be dancing again. So, okay. yeah, okay. so that's, I'm looking forward to that. There. Yes, yes, Laura. I was just going to say, Sarah did that right around the time when my family and I started coming to the church. So that was probably about two years ago, two and a half years oh, ago. started coming back. Yeah. yeah. And... I remember because my son, which he doesn't come to church very often, you know, and he's gone now, but he came with us that time and he saw Sarah do that. And he was like, <laughs> you know, he didn't know that you could do that in church. And he was like, oh, she's look at her. I was like, son, I, I, it's a different thing than what you're thinking. You know, yeah, I guess she's a very cute girl, you know, but he was like, I'll have to rethink this church thing. Uh. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, it hasn't been that long ago, but yeah, that definitely had an impact on my family as well. And my yes. son has been trying to do some church things through the military, <laughs> whether it's online or the chaplain or where, whatever base he's at, you know, since then. So I, I kind of like to thank Sarah for that, you know, <laughs> kind of sparked something that day. Yes. But yeah. I mean, everybody is inspired and dances to their own tune. Yes. She is such a grace-filled dancer, that's oh, for sure. Yes, so absolutely. Yeah. So then we have a, a reading from Zephaniah on the bottom of page 48. Zephaniah 3 says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. So what, um, what jumps out at you in this uh, scripture passage? Yes, Jim. I think to me, it's, uh, you know, God is the one who's performing and he's, you know, he's just, he's in the midst of just kind of loving us, and caring for us and protecting us and, you know, just defending us and all these different things that, uh, you know, he's doing for us and for me. Yeah. You know, uh, on uh, this coming Sunday, I'm going to preach on um, um, a prophet, um, the prophet Daniel, uh, you know, with uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and all that stuff and uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and the whole story of King Nebuchadnezzar is, you know, look at me, look what I have done, bow down to me and all this stuff. Uh, and then, you know, we get to this prophet of Zephaniah and, you know, we're, what are we doing in this path? We're not doing anything. You know, the Lord, your God is with you. You know, he is saving you. He will take great delight in you. He's quieting you with his love. He's rejoice, rejoicing over you with singing. You know, God is this actor that has come, you know, he's with you. It's this incarnational language. He's among us. Um, and all, all the only thing we are called to do is to, to you know, relish this kind of love, uh, this kind of salvation that God is willing to give us. Um, there's none, there's no because therefore language in this text. You know, because you have done this, then God has chosen to do this. It's simply, you know, because God takes great delight in you, he will save you, he will quiet you, he will, you know, rejoice over you with singing. Um, it's powerful language, uh, that's for sure. So, um, any other thoughts? Yes, Carol. Well, I kind of read it as parental language because I take great delight in my son. I quiet him with, you know, it's my father being proud of me and loving me too. Yeah. Even though I don't deserve it. Yeah. What, and what do we do with that kind of language? You know, that um, God quiets us with his love and he rejoices over you with singing um, you know, that's very personal language, right? Um, what do we do with that? How does that make you feel? Um, you know, the second question is, how would it affect you to hear God whisper to you, I delight in you? What is that like? Yes, it's like a happy, it's like a happy hymn. <laughs> 
makes you yeah. feel good inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I um, I once attended a, a wedding um, where uh, the couple did their own vows, and instead of the groom um, just sharing vows, um, he grabbed a guitar and kind of knelt before his bride and sang her this love song that he had written himself. Um, and of course, there wasn't a dry eye, you know, anywhere. It was just this beautiful song. And um, in the midst of that, I thought, you know, that's what Jesus does to us. You know, he kneels down before us. You know, we have this text of Jesus kneeling before his disciples and washing their feet. But, you know, he kneels before us and he sings us this very personal love song uh, that, you know, even when we don't deserve it, God, you know, Jesus sings us this song saying, you know, I'm going to love you no matter what, and nothing can ever separate <laughs> us. Um, and I think that's so powerful. Um, you know, songs for me, especially, they, uh, they stick with me more. Uh, whenever I have to remember something, I usually set it to music because it, it sticks with me. Um, you know, just like um, Laura, you were talking about, you know, lyrics from when you were growing up, you know, I grew up in the 70s and a, a, a song from the 70s comes on the radio and I know every single lyric, you know, <laughs> it's amazing because it just sticks, sticks with you. So um, I think this is the power of, of God singing us this love song to make sure that it, it sticks with us. Yes, Marsha. Kimlin and, and Kirby and Timo went to a tribute band in Austin this weekend and they did country music from the 80s and Kenlin said I was so proud I knew every word <laughs> <laughs> yes and she and Timo got up and danced Timo wanted to dance they got up and danced <laughs> Neat. Neat. Yeah. yes yes Nancy um I it has happened but it isn't happening right now but a lot of people that suffer memory loss and Alzheimer's, one of the things that they can still do is sing. It's interesting. And one of the, and especially things that they have known, you know, songs they have known. And um, a friend of mine who was a choir director at our previous church, she told me about a friend back in um, the Midwest that actually had a, a choir in which all of the singers had memory loss. Wow. But they could still sing. That was one of the last things that they lost, if you will, as the situation progressed. Yes. Or degenerated, depending on how you look at that. Yep. Powerful stuff. The, uh, you know, the same thing happens um, in my first call. I would do a, a monthly service for the, uh, the memory care unit. Um, and it looked like they weren't there. I mean, I was, you know, talking, they were there, but it just, you know, nothing, I didn't think anything was connecting until I got to the Lord's prayer. Um, and then when I started reciting the Lord's prayer, every single person in that room just started reciting the Lord's prayer. I mean, it was just mm -hmm. there deep within their memory. Uh, and they just came alive in that moment. So, um, it's powerful, you know, the, the memories that we carry. Yes, Carol. Mm -hmm. I was, it made me think my sister, um, actually had her degree in music therapy and she did her internship at a hospice and the doctors would prescribe music therapy instead of pain medicine. And she said she'd take her guitar and go and sing amazing grace. And they would sing with her. And so for a, a short period of time, they were pain free because of these singing, these hymns and songs. And I thought that's really power of music. Yes. Yes. Music is very healing. <laughs> yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Any other thought? Yes, Marcia. Well, and when you said um, about setting things to music, that's probably how we all learned our ABCs in the beginning. Indeed, oh. indeed, yes. Yeah. Because Carol will know this. Yeah. If you want, yeah. if you want little ones to remember it, you set it to music. Mm hmm. Yes. Neat. Any last comments? Well, why don't we close with prayer? Thank you, Lord, for this time together and for loving us unconditionally, for delighting us when, when we feel unlovable. Open our ears to hear the songs that you are singing in our daily lives. And all God's people said, 
Amen. 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 So thank you all for joining us. We will see you next week. God bless.